What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast, episode number 198. Uh, as always, uh, I am your host, Bailey Eigbrett, and joined uh, with me here is my co-host, Mr. Andy Full, the captain. What's okay. going on, dude? Oh, you know, um, truck just got picked up, got towed, um, getting some tech stuff done for 2020 and looking forward to getting out fishing. It's been beautiful in New York, so seven, almost 70 degrees today. What's up with you? Yeah, dude, I was out in shorts and a t-shirt with my dog today, taking a taking a break from a little bit of work and took him for a walk. And uh, it was weird because it's mid-March. Yeah. And awesome. mid-March last year, I was on the water, bundled up, freezing my butt off. Uh, but yeah, I, d- I got taxes done the other day. That was kind of a little stressful. Um, but thankfully, the numbers I saw on the screen weren't as bad as I thought they were. So we're good. Oh, did, did you get um, that part figured out that I told you about? that helped you with i still have to figure that part out but i have like i I went through the process like with TurboTax and all and kind of like figured everything out and just have to file it but have just kind of final details like that as well that i need to figure out just to see uh how much money i can get back so so i'm trying to trying to maximize on that the goal is always to get paid not pay yeah to dump as much money as we can from the state into student notes because why not but enough about taxes uh today we are here to talk about fishing current but a couple quick announcements before we do that. Uh, obviously, today is a Wednesday when you guys are listening or watching to this, unless you view it at a later time. Um, so today is Tuesday, as Andrew and I are recording it. And a huge shout out and congratulations to uh, Bill Lowen, Dalla Bill Lowen, as they like to say. On I win, 16 years in the making. And what a baller way to do it, dude, with an eight and a half pounder. I was watching... Not supposed to be watching, but I was watching at work, and I think I fist pumped like when he put that fish in the boat, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's a freaking giant!" And uh, buddy, he goes, Dude, "That fish is all of six. I'm like, "That fish is like eight or nine. And he's like, "No," I was like, "Oh yeah, that that could be a ten, but once they get above seven, it's hard to tell." I was like, "I would go eat that." It would have been so much funnier, though, if you were watching that from the bathroom and people, people had heard you. Oh, my God, that was a giant. <laughs> <laughs> that was <would've been> fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, like, he, uh, Bill caught that thing, and he goes, uh, I think it was, oh, who was it? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't. It was Denny Brower texting him the night before. No, it was Tommy. Yeah, no, it was Tommy Sanders that said, oh, that's got to be, like, a six-pounder, right? And. Zona goes, uh, at least. He goes, I'm going over eight. And, <laughs> and they marked it as a seven and a quarter. And I'm like, that is not a seven and a quarter. <laughs> yeah, that was a big fish. Yeah, that was a giant, dude. When he cracked it, too, like, you knew. Like, you just saw his rod did not move. Yeah. You're like, okay. He ain't playing around. Drops an eight-pounder on the scales. And, like, dude, if he didn't catch that eight, he, I mean, even if that was a four-pounder, he wouldn't have won. I know. Which is wild. Because Brock Mosley sacked him up. Oh, he did. I think either way, it would have been a obviously story worthy event, but I think I think Mosley weighed twenty smallmouth in. Did he have all smallies? I believe he weighed twenty smallies. That's pretty sick. Which, what was interesting was he. They mentioned on live is that he did not hit the tail race until the last day when everyone was gone. Mm-hmm. Talk about saving up. Yeah, he got there and thumped on him. Yeah, like people are saying that they're beating up on him up there, and it's just like obviously not. <laughs> no, so that's, that's kind of like – it's like almost foreshadowing, talking about like current fish, right? Right. talking current tonight. And obviously we saw what happened at Pickwick. It was eight foot high, six to eight foot high, raging currents, 1.5 million gallons flown over the Wilson Dam into the Pickwick at – was it every second or five seconds? I don't remember exact like CFS. Well, this amount. I mean, anyone that watched Steve Kennedy up there, that was nuts. Insane. 200,000 CFS. So, to put it in perspective of how hard that current was flowing, if anybody has ever hiked in the lower Niagara near uh, Whirlpool State Park, the current coming through the lower Niagara at Whirlpool State Park is 1.1 million cubic feet per second. So what was that? What is that in comparison then? 
So Pickwick was flowing at a quarter of the total flow of the lower Niagara. That is insane. So your average trout stream in New York State will flow between 300 to 1,000 cubic feet per second. Dang. That water was moving. It was kind of scary, like that picture up there. And they showed that flashback of that famous uh, – can't remember what his name was. Something Miller, I believe his name was, that uh, was trying to oh, drive yeah. his Yamaha, Miller. his Yamaha rat boat, and got stuck on the rocks and was getting thrown around. Yeah, it's scary stuff up there, dude. You got to be experienced. Like they they reassured everyone. Like when Steve Kennedy went up in there, and like Brock Mosley went up in there. It's like these guys have lived in situations like this, so they're comfortable. And even Steve Kennedy said, and he goes, obviously I've lived in these types of situations. Like I'm comfortable. Because even today, I was uncomfortable in that because it was moving that hard. And it, I think it was you that mentioned, because you have obviously have friends down there that mentioned that uh, 190,000 was a lot, the most they've ever seen on that. And seeing 200,000 was just ridiculous. Yeah. So, like a really good base flow on Pickwick, from my understanding, is between like 110 to 130. So, during practice, it was at like 85 to 95, somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact number which is low, like that's low for that fishery coming out of the Wilson Dam into Pickwick and then what it was drawing down. So the virtually the water doubled what they were fishing in the tournament, and it's a six to eight foot swing of water rise. So normal pool is somewhere probably roughly in half, so that 120, 130 CFS. And I think today it got down to like 185, so it was starting to get normal but still ripping. But that the cool part is we got to see people that were fishing the current. They were making repetitive casts because those fish are so strategically placed that they just wad. Yeah, and that's, and that's cool, not, the cool neat things about current little prelude. Yeah, and that's like exactly what we're going to be hitting on today is that kind of the more current, the less areas. It kind of like like you like you mentioned offline. We were talking about this and getting ready for tonight's show is the more current, the less areas those fish will be, making it much more simpler on you to target them. And like you said, they're going to be making, if the more current, the less areas that smaller that that strike zone, uh, kind of making it a lot simpler, and you're making the same cast over and over. What you saw, like, a Steve Kennedy do, where he literally got right up on a current break, like a pool, essentially, and was just making pitches left and right, the same pitch over and over again. And then randomly, get a bite. You know, mm -hmm. and then, like, 10 pitches later, get a bite. He was making the same thing over and over again. But what they mentioned about like what Steve was doing is that the current was so fast and the, the target zones were so small that he was like had to get on top of them in that pool in order to literally efficiently have his boat stay there and not be rocking around everywhere and being thrown back like he did and ended up having that crazy fish catch. Well, not fish catch because he broke off. Yeah. Oh, man, that fish was all of six plus. Like that was a monster. Yeah. The way, if you, like for anyone that saw that rod and the way that rod was getting just, I mean, the head shakes from when he first realized he had a fish on, that was a big, a fish that was thrown. Because Steve Kennedy doesn't throw no limpy rods. He throws big and beef, and yeah. especially with the big old spinner bakes, I think he's throwing like a three quarter ounce. And so he's throwing a beef stick. Yeah. For a fish to be able to have the head shakes on a rod like that, that's a big fish. Absolutely. And I mean, current doesn't help. So like if let's say it's like a four pounder and it and it head shakes in current that's three to four miles an hour, it's going to feel big and you'll mm -hmm. see it. But that fish was well over four. Control, yeah, it was crazy. He could not control that thing whatsoever. Yeah, that's one of the cool things about current and scary parts about current is those fish come off so easily because mm -hmm. they have so much leverage. So you're not only fighting the fish. But you're also fighting your line on the current when they get perpendicular to you, the boat, and they start like tailing off. So let's say the current is flowing this way, right? And the fish goes perpendicular to it. Now you have current working against the line. If that fish turns, that line goes slack at any moment. That fish can just come right off. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that people don't really realize about current. So it's. I think one thing kind of in line with that too is like obviously fighting it, but your hook set is a lot of it's you're really reeling into your fish to make sure you have that tension before you set the hook. Yeah. Um, I know they mentioned that on live as well as 
you know, there's a lot of guys that aren't used to like Chad Pipkins, I think was talking about it saying, you know, he missed a lot of fish because of that current and not adjusting to his line. He didn't have enough tension in his line before he set the hook. Whereas it's a lot of, you know, you're feeling that bite and you're getting a couple to two or three, four, maybe four uh, qu- turns of the reel, reel handle. And then you're really leaning and setting the hook and burying it in them because you're picking up that slack in your line, that bow in your line from that current, yeah. which is actually really cool to think about. So one of my favorite ways to set the hook when I current fish is actually, it's almost like a hard set, but it's a hard set with a reel and walk. So let's say we're kind of jumping ahead here, but let's say I have the bow facing, let's say we have the bow facing up current. So I'm casting ahead into the current and I'm bringing the bait back to me. A lot of times those fish will eat your bait as it's coming towards the boat but what they'll do is they'll eat it and turn and swim back at you with that current mm-hmm. so now you're fighting the bow a fish running at you so you almost hit the reel until you feel that rod tip load and usually at that point they're still coming at you so you almost hit the reel fast hit them as hard as you can and walk backwards and keep reeling really fast so mm-hmm. you get that tension and by the time you start coming back up you just keep reeling most of the time they're at the boat and the fight's almost over because there's so much different forces at play it's it's really a unique way to fight them yeah and depending on the current and i know i know this is something that we were going to kind of try to touch on a little bit here throughout the show depending on certain scenarios uh is if you're in a situation like that where you can fish that water with a kayak it makes it very challenging to not only hook the fish but keep it pinned oh yeah and then because what if you get sucked into like a white water situation like Let's say Pickwick was at a 90,000 CFS, so so low. And and a lot of people fish those tail raceways, even in kayaks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a very dangerous situation. I know we talked about it with, uh, oh, what was his name? The guy from South Carolina. I'm drawing a blank. South Carolina. You talking about Drew Gregory? Yeah, Drew Gregory. He's in Ohio now. We were talking about it with yeah. him. Sorry. Yeah. We, we got all over the place with him, but how he fishes tailwaters yeah. and how dangerous it is because the boats are, as soon as you hook a fish, especially in a kayak, you're leaning, the current can pull you, pull bow down, your your mm-hmm. tail down. Like there's all kinds of stuff that I would never do it. Personally. Rocks. I mean, you look, you got to think about like that boat, that, that boat where the video they're showing that boat getting thrown around. I mean, kayaks are still going to hit those too. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you're more susceptible to be thrown out of that especially yeah. being in a kayak. So it's, well, it's there's a lot more challenges at play in it being in a kayak. But at the same point in time, if you're in a kayak, you can – like you look at Steve Kennedy and how he was struggling to stay in that target zone. Granted, in that situation, you will never be in a kayak. You were the biggest idiot if you try to go out in something like that in a kayak. Yeah, I don't sure care what how it might be. That's just stupid. But like on certain current situations, you can sit a kayak. You can fit a kayak into current breaks a lot easier than you can a boat. So if you can do it, great. I mean, they make power poles for, for kayaks now. So you can do it efficiently. Um, but you just have to know that, kind of like what we're talking about now, with a kayak versus a boat where you can set that hook and, you know, obviously catch up, set the hook, and walk back with them. You can't do that in a kayak. So you almost have to reel down a little bit more, mm-hmm. and then you're just going to have to give them the beans and hope that, you know, they're not going to come off, and it's just going to be part of that game. There's an extra an added variable. Yeah. So one of the cool little things about a kayak, and this intrigues me about it, um, is there's a lot of little mountain mountain or stream or hill creeks all across the country that have all these uh, unexploited bass populations that you would never think have them, but they have a good current flow. There's oh, yeah. one me that I used to walk into and wade. that I've also kayak fish, well, canoe fish from. And I mean, I'm telling you, there's We've caught numerous 17 to 19 inch smallmouth out of this creek, which is oh, that's, cool. it's so much fun, dude. I mean, like if you want to think about like shoal bass that get pretty damn big, mm-hmm. shoal bass is like best accessible by kayak. Yeah, it is. It's one of those things where it's actually more of like a white water river that you got to go down through. It's that it's kind of cool to to access from a kayak. Uh, there's there's some really good channels out there for people that might want to watch stuff. Like, I mean, Justin Lucas has stuff like that where he took a Jackson kayak and went in these backwaters where it's a lot of current. I mean, he's flowing probably one to two miles an hour, but it's cool to the point where you can actually stay steady uh, where your place is in that middle of that Creek or stream, whatever have you. And he's just cast along the bank. He's not paddling or nothing. 
and it's kind of cool how you can fish that uh, granted it, it can be kind of tricky like you got to be moving fast you know you can't really pick that apart which is another thing we're going to be talking about today is there's like there's different levels of current right i mean you have pickwick the some insane current that we saw this past week you have like a niagara river or a saint lawrence river where it's more of you know that it one to two mile an hour chain yeah yeah where it's more of your essentially what your popular way of fishing is going to be drifts you're going to find a good point an area a pile whatever have you you're going to target something and you're going to target by getting on top of, of that drift on top of that area and letting your that water flow push you back on top of it and drifting over it and you're just making that same same drift over and over again getting back and etc yep. moving on but you have that and you have like small creeks you have like a mississippi river where there's current but it's slow enough to the point where it you can fish it effectively and you can move against it, but it has, still has enough current to create these eddies and these current breaks and uh, places for these fish to obviously stack up and, and not be so spread out. Right. And then you um, have wind driven currents, you mm -hmm. have tidal currents, like there's all kinds of crazy. I think wind driven and tidal turn are tidal uh, current are the most confusing by far. Yes. I think tidal is one I think we talked about offline that we're not even going to touch on tonight because we have zero experience. Uh, but I think it's something that we'd love to have, you know, like a Brian Schmidt on to specifically just break down how to fish tidal waters, um, more of how to read them, obviously what tides are better, why they're better, kind of breaking down the science of that. Uh, but wind driven is one that I learned about last summer and really started to dial down. And it's something that's uh, not that I'm trying to focus on, but like, Something throughout the year, when I see it, there's a really hard south or north wind or an east or west, depending on the body of water. We're looking at like our finger lakes or glacier lakes because they run north to south. Mm -hmm. That can provide a lot of wind driven current. Uh, and I've definitely seen that in scenarios in the past and just completely looked past it and didn't think about it, where it could really play a variable. And you know, you could be fishing grass and complete, fishing it completely wrong. Yep. You might have smashed them the day before, but it was really windy overnight. And then you blank the next day, same conditions, but really there could be a current flow from that hard wind. You know, let, let's start on the wind-driven current because that's almost kind of an easy one to go through real fast. Right. My, my prime example for wind-driven current is taking something obvious and figuring out what the wind is doing and why and how the fish are going to set up on it. So let's, let's take a bridge scenario, something that expands all the way across the water. Right, so a lot of times with the bridge, you're gonna have pilings that come down, and you already have your targeted depth zone that you know you're gonna fish. So first thing you're gonna to want to think about on that bridge is which way is the wind blowing from. If I have a bridge that's laying east to west, is the wind blowing north? Is it blowing south? Is it blowing east or is it west? Where are these fish going to position on the wind? So let's say that bridge is lying east to west, and you have a north wind. Personally, the spot that I'm going to start on the first is going to be the south side of that bridge. Casting because north. Casting correct? so your note the boat, the nose of your boat, the bow of your boat will be pointed north into the wind. That's one thing I can't stress enough is with current wind, same thing. Always try to fish into it because the fish are going to be pointed in the direction that the wind is coming from or the current. So in the case of wind-driven current, you're going to have it hitting these pilings that are coming down into the water, and you're going to get little soft bubble seams behind that bridge. So you have that oxygen flow from the current hitting that bridge. It's going to create a big oxygen bubble behind it, and it's also going to create a current break. So those mm -hmm. fish are going to treat that bridge pylon almost as an ambush point. And based on if it's slightly northeast or if it's northwest coming in that bridge, you might see that the fish will set up on either the east corner or the west corner of that bridge based on how that current's coming around. Or you could even catch them in the middle of the pilings because that's where the current break is. You might have like a tree in there or a rock. So it's really significant to graph it and figure out where your bottom is as well. Yeah. I mean, stuff like, especially talking about a bridge, you can see a lot of times if there is current, you can see obviously that water pushing against it, creating almost a V on the backside it almost kind of highlights your strike zone for you. Like almost like a, it literally says here, cast, you know, present yeah, your bait yeah. by me. So yeah. you're going to cast above it and obviously bring that bait down into it. Um, and that's one thing that's super interesting. And it's, it's, you know, it's talking from this example, 
you know, there's depending on how fast the current is, I think a lot of people can mess up their presentation where they might be doing it correctly and how they're positioning themselves. But say they're casting like a, a single swimmer, right? On like a half ounce head, they'll cast along that piling, bring it by that strike zone. You'll get a couple bites, but they might be still reeling it, even though there's already current. You might be burning that too fast. Yep. Where I found in some cases in that situ in that situation, what I'll do is just just keep my line tight. I won't reel it because that current and that bait with that head is going to fall at a rate and will pendulum almost tight lining that bait. And you can find your that you're going to hit that strike zone a little bit better. Yeah. Finally, it's something to play around with and obviously let the fish tell you what they want, but it's oh, something and, to factor in. So let's take it in. For example, let's go the single swim bait route. So you have three different target zones that you can fish with it. Right. So if you have a barren bottom on that bridge, you can drag it. So you're almost, slowly dragging it on a fully slack line right so mm -hmm. it's tight but it's slack so you're pulling it almost like a football jig retreat so you're, you're dragging it um that your next cast you're like okay they're not on the bottom they might be up in the strike zone or looking up and feeding so that next cast you speed up your retrieve to where you're not feeling bottom but you still have that nice pendulum in your line so it's free flowing with that current then you can have that taut line to where it's coming back at a certain speed and go super taut and almost blow it out of the water. You never know, you might have one to come up and eat it. You almost have to tell, you almost have to have the fish tell you what they want. And it's pretty easy. You can approach current and cover like that and fish multiple different ways and figure it out relatively quick with a small array of baits. Yeah. And it's almost one thing too is, I mean, obviously you can graph over the fish, see how they position. Obviously, you probably want to give them 10, 15 minutes for the most part, depending on what's going on, to give them a break because you literally just ran over them. But generally speaking, if it's a bridge, they're probably used to boat traffic, and it's really not going to matter much. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think water column's huge. I think if it, the water clarity is good, I don't think column's like a huge player. I think if you get it in like general, I think if they're going to be in current, they're going to be aggressive anyways, so they'll come out for it. Um, I mean, like swim baits, right? I mean, swim baits would be good. Depending on you know depth and where they're how they're setting up, chatter baits are good. Spinner baits, a rigs. I mean, the, the list kind of goes on. It, it's a lot of these you can throw completely different applications for them and kind of extensive. I mean, talk, look, look at uh, you know we had Joshua Butts and he mentioned how he literally just like slack lines a mag draft, lets it fall just literally straight down. Yeah. So I mean, it, you can get really creative with it. Um, but I think with wind current, with wind current as well. Um, obviously we talk about hard structure, but I think, um, we should talk about grass. And that was the biggest thing that I learned last summer was with that wind current, how you flip grass, especially in that heat of summer, you could be around fish. You could pick up a couple, but you could still be presenting it completely wrong because obviously how, you know, these fish are going to face, you know, face the current is going to be hitting the fish in the face. So if you're going with the current, say you're letting your boat drift over a grass flat and you're flipping, you know, with your boat, you yeah, could be presenting your that. Your foil is laying over this way and you're flipping into it this way and pulling your bait out. You're not being effective because you're almost flipping it into those weeds and the fish aren't going to react to it. I think that's what you're going at, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're going to be flipping and you're almost like you might get lucky and nail one right on the head. But for the most part, depending on how you're presenting that bait, you're just going to be pushing it behind them, bringing it from the tail to their head rather than in front of their face. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go against that wind current, and for the most part, wind current isn't going to be a lot. It's going to be enough where you can tap on that trolling motor for a couple seconds and you'll drift forward a little bit. It's just enough for, like you said, have that grass lay over. It's enough for those fish feel it, and they will therefore position against that current. Therefore, if you flip, you, know, you hop it a couple times. When you hop it and bring it towards yourself a little bit, it's going to be more presenting it naturally coming down that current into their face. Yep. Yeah. So and that's definitely something that's a really huge overlook fact in, in grass fisheries that a lot of people won't hit on. It's look for this type of grass, no slime, because if you have slime, the oxygen depletion has gone. But I mean, the wind could move slime and clear up algae blooms. So yes, the type of or in the type of bottom in those weeds is important. But one of the biggest things is making the right presentation the way the grass is laying. Don't – you almost have to make it simple to understand – let's put it in layman's terms. If 
if it's a east to west lake and you got a hard west wind, the grass is probably going to lay what east to west, right? So how would you position your boat there, Bailey? So if you're east to west, you said there's a west wind. Oh yeah, so the grass would be laying west to east. Sorry. So it'll it'll almost it, it can switch because if it's a hard west wind, so it's going east. Obviously that that grass will lay east for a period when that wind is ripping, right? Creating that current. But afterwards, when that wind dies down, there's going to be a current that therefore switches and turns back flowing west for that lake to resettle and level out. So you got to get almost two different directions. Um, so when that wind is ripping out of the west into the east and that so that grass is pointed east, I'm going to be positioned towards the west going against that current, presenting my bait towards the west, bringing it back east, if that makes sense. So you're casting away, bringing it towards you as you're facing that current. And same thing I'll go for when that current, obviously when that lake's leveling out. Mm -hmm. That's essentially how I do it. Uh, like we, like you mentioned with the bridge, facing the wind. Yep. Because that's you're, if you face the wind, the fish are going to be facing the wind because they're going to be facing the current. Talking about wind-driven current, you basically want to mimic what those fish are doing, and that's how you're going to present that bait correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. But kind of moving on from that, I think, and a really important one to talk about is like a Niagara River, like a St. Lawrence River. Um, I'm trying to think maybe like a, I, we could probably ask um, Cody Holland, like a, maybe Columbia could be the same way with how they, those, they drift certain structures mm -hmm. where it's kind of like a strategic drift where you can, you know, there's a certain structure or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a transition, whatever have you, where you're going to get above that when it's a current based fishery, get above it so that that current brings you past that spot. And you're basically trying to use your trolling motor and your GPS with your, you probably have these places waypointed. And you're trying to position yourself to stay in that strike zone. And you're basically just having your bait on the bottom and you're not doing anything with it. You have it controlled, you know, the distance align, and you're just kind of keeping it there. You're really not doing much with it. <laughs> you're letting that yeah. current do all the work. I think this is one of my least favorite ways to fish is drift fishing because it is mindless for the most part and boring. Once you know how to set up, let's, let's just go straight current no way right and we're gonna float let's call it a 20 foot hump and the average depth around it is 30 foot so mm -hmm. first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna pull up ahead of the hump based on where you stand and where you think the fish are laying based on the way you stand so you're gonna you might have the hump waypoint you might have the fish waypoint so what you want to do is you want to figure out the way the boat is going to drift with no wind just on the current to float across those fish to present your bait properly. And that's the biggest key to it is figuring out boat positioning on the current, by the way the current's flowing, because a lot of these rivers are so vast and wide, there's no breaks. It's just, there might be something funny in the water, like a buoy 300 yards ahead of you. And that makes the surface current break to where it was flowing this way but all of a sudden you might have it go this way like it's mm -hmm. just, it's all boat positioning based on what you're looking for and how you find it it can be the most confusing i think to learn but once you kind of get the general idea it's probably one of the easiest to do yeah, yeah. Right. but it can also be like it's very challenging you know we talked about like a saint lawrence river which i've experienced before we had obviously the saint lawrence river flows from lake ontario so it flows east to west mm -hmm. you have a it flows west to east you pulled the main one backwards oh yeah solid west <laughs> when it flows west to east and you have a hard east wind i've been on that where there's been like a 25 mile an hour east wind where it pushes your boat you keeps you almost in steady Oh, it can be very challenging. It's more it, it it makes you work a lot harder where you're going to be casting up and you're just going to have to keep that line tension to make sure that because that current's still going to push your bait and you're just going to keep that line tension and you're just basically going to follow it almost kind of like I would picture like your steelhead fishing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that basically how you do it where it's like a float? You know, and I have no idea what was steelhead. Okay, so steelhead fishing is a little bit different because you're using this tiny little float that's like this. right, but like the idea of you're you're basically floating it and you're doing it controlled and then you're just kind of remaking the same float. Is that or am I completely wrong? So yes and no. So 
<laughs> I actually, when I steelhead fish, I prefer an up current wind because it slows you down. It slows your presentation down. So in a lot of situations, your boat is going to flow faster than the current on the bottom because surface current is always quicker than bottom current once you get over a certain depth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you could have a good east wind that slows your boat down enough to where you can almost fish vertical. But where it get, becomes difficult is when you have a one mile an hour west current, a west west to east current, <laughs> and that wind blows 30 miles out of the east. Now you almost, your boat is slower than that surface current. So it actually causes the reverse effect and your bait will actually end up behind your boat because you're not drifting fast enough. If at all, it yeah. might keep you in place. <laughs> yeah, so that's when you almost have to learn some other tricks and by going against all the rules and putting the trolling motor upwind in current and doing some funky things to try and match that current speed. Um, yeah. Personally, what I do is, which I it doesn't work everywhere, is I will try to find more shallow current and try to find active fish that I can actually fish properly. Because I get frustrated when I'm blowing up river in two mile an hour current, which happens all the time on the, on the Niagara. So, because I flow south to north, and in the fall, we get strong north winds. And it, I've been on the Niagara River. This is another safety issue, like we saw at Pickwick, is when you get, this is why they canceled day one, by the way. When you have a heavy current flow and a strong wind that is counteracting that current, it causes a stack, like a stacking effect of water. So not only are you dealing with waves, but they grow like momentously like big and they're short stacked together. It's extremely treacherous to drive. And I've been on the upper Niagara in five footers in a tiny little river from like 40 mile an hour north winds. So it's not, no, <laughs> not fun. Not fun. But so, I mean, that one's, that's pretty simple. I mean, it's, you know, for the most part, you want to let that current work for you, use it to your advantage. Um, but I think another current base that we're to, to touch upon is like a Mississippi River or, and I don't know what a, like a James River or Potomac is like, but uh, a Mississippi, I think I've seen enough, um, at least from online to kind of, and I we've, we have some small bias of water that are sort relatively similar to it, mm -hmm. um, where it's not, it's a current base, obviously it's a current based river, it doesn't, it's not crazy current, but it's to the point where you can work against that current and it's that current is still going to create these pools, these eddies, and obviously therefore condense these fish a little bit better. And they're not obviously going to be roaming around everywhere. Um, and something like that, I think is a lot of fun because that's where you can see a lot of more power fishing coming into play. Um, kind of relatively the same base that you'd see at like a pickwick, where you're going to see a lot of spinner baits. Uh, you could see guys flipping jigs into the pools um, you know, a, a body like that, like a Mississippi, for example, you get there, it's a lot of frogging, a lot of top water, um, where you can get kind of creative with it. It's more of a shallow body of water. I think that one's the most fun. And I think that one is honestly probably the most obvious when it comes to how to actually target it, mm -hmm. uh, because of those pools and not, not just Mississippi, for example, but cause that that's its own body of water in itself with the undercut banks and whatever, but with that shallow water, things are, it makes things very obvious. Um, and like you said, fishing current can be very simple. Now, if you make it too hard on yourself, I mean, it's... So, so. <laughs> here's my biggest tidbit on current fishing. So I'm going to kind of circle back to the Niagara River, and I showed you this cool little blow through that we were fishing, how the current always changes mm -hmm. in there. But um, if you do not like to get out deep and drag and do all this weird stuff. I, I call it weird stuff because I find it absolutely boring, but it catches fish. You can find like any hard piece of structure that has a little bit of depth to it. Let's call it six to 15 foot of water. And if there's a hard spot sticking up, let's call it like a docking pylon. If there's a docking pylon, 
and you have good bottom composition and a cutout and a big old eddy behind it, there's probably going to be fish because mm -hmm. it's literally an ambush point. So it kind of goes back to the bridge theory with the wind. That current is always going to be coming off of that pylon the same way unless it stacks up where it's out of the wind. And those fish are always there. Not, you might not catch the biggest fish on them. But you're going to be able to have a lot of fun and catch a ton of fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a great way to look at it. That specific blow through that we went through was crazy because you like you had to switch. Like yeah. kind of how it was working. It, it was really cool because you had to change your position and really keep up with it, which is actually kind of cool because it's like a window timing deal. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're five you. minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes yeah. here, five minutes there. Inside, outside, inside, outside. Yeah. <laughs> you like flip-flopping. It was like kind of like, uh, it's just, it was weird. It, it's kind of cool. And, and once you can kind of really dial in how the current works, you can, oh, you can really follow those fish really efficiently. You can kind of almost predict where they're going to be. Um, obviously you're going to have random rogues, but for the most part, fish simple, because that's what current does. It, it really kind of, it pushes them, those, the fish together, condenses them. Uh, cause obviously they're not going to want to sit in the current, you know, 24 seven, you know, they're going to sit in those pools waiting for that bait, that ox more oxygenated area. Um, you know, and it's, I'm trying to see what we have here, uh, how to position yourself. So I think this is one of the things that was really important. Um, and kind of one thing that we talked about, um, earlier with, you know, like a Niagara river or St. Lawrence river, uh, quickly going back to that positioning wise, obviously you want to drift with these. Um, but I think it'd be best suited for you to answer this question is your boat positioning, because it is important where the nose of your boat is when you're trying to do these drifts. So I want to talk about that real quick. All right. So. I'm going to pull, pull up a picture real fast. I, I don't know if I can do that. I'm, I'm trying to explain it without like a visual representation. Bear with me. Okay. So we're just going off of a drip, right? Sorry. Right. I'm going to draw a picture. <laughs> we're just going to do like a little topography here. Don't mind my art skills because I am not Picasso. <laughs> any means and these artistic abilities here yes. put to the test yes fisher dude girl whatever serious artist here. huh serious artist <laughs> yes <laughs> okay <laughs> total sidebar for people here before we break this down we talked about it yes uh on monday night live but if we're kind of like trying to play off this little non-serious side to the serious angler podcast here Calling it the serious tangler, uh, basically making fun of myself for a specific photo of me just bird nesting a reel. Uh, but we thought it'd be kind of funny to make shirts for it, kind of for the guy, the people who are fans of the show. Uh, if you guys would be interested in some sort of thing, we'll get a graphic made up of it. But uh, reach out to us or comment down below or what have you if you guys would be interested in getting involved in the serious angler community. We're gonna try to make some merch here. Uh, but we want to gauge your guys' interest first before we start doing that. But, yeah, so let us know. Uh, yeah, Andy, continue. Sorry. I, I was drawing some fishes. All right. Some so fish. here is my, my Andy, Andy Picasso picture, right? So this arrow here is your current. This is right. your current system. Here's your topography. Here's your, here's your hump. I'm looking at this backwards through the camera. If we have a west wind. We'll call it west. So on this hump here, the boat positioning is going to be on the side of the hump that the wind is blowing to, because fish always use the back side of things as ambush points. So you have deep water all around 35 foot. You have the top of the hump, we'll call it 18. The outside of the hump will somewhere around 25, and that whole thing will be different because you want to graph it to make sure. But most of the time as you're drifting down this current, you'll want to position yourself on that hump after you graph it based on the wind where you think the fish are going to be. Your active ones are probably going to be up on top. Those a lot of times are your more agile, smaller fish. And as you start sliding off based on your boat positioning, we'll call it on the east side of the hump because the wind is blowing from the west. As you're sliding down with this current, your boat position, you want to set down on top of what you plan on dragging through, and you're going to drag it with your guy up current, casting up current with the wind and you want to almost keep your boat 
position coming down that side of the hump. Coming back, and then depending on how far you line out, you'll drift past it, mm -hmm. and then start the whole process over again. So mm -hmm. you start up your motor, drive back up, and do the same thing. If you keep catching them, you keep catching them. Just one thing to know about current that a lot of people don't realize is you can spend too much time in one area because current fish are opportunistic eaters. When they're eating, they're eating. When they're not, they are not. You need to go find something else somewhere else that they're going to eat. And a lot of times it can be the same exact type of structure. I'm um, half a mile down the river and you pull up on it, it's on and then off. And then you go back to the other hump and it's on again. So it's just mm -hmm. having multiple spots to cycle through. Unlike what we kind of saw at Pickwick, some guys hunkered down in one area and just kept catching them and catching them and catching them. And it's because it's a flood stage. On a normal situation, those fish are going to feed in very specific little windows until you take a couple of their buddies and they're like, I know what's going on here. Yeah. The next one, you can kind of bounce back and forth. Yeah. I think it's also good to highlight that uh, there are, are cases where, you know, say a hump like that, your picture. You mentioned that there's fish that are sitting off of it. There might be those bigger fish. Obviously, there's, there's fishing on top of it. That the fish on top of it are going to be more agile because that's where there's going to be faster current because it's shallow sure. water. Exactly. There's going to be a current break on that backside where a lot of fish are going to sit up on. Picasso's oh, that's perfect. <laughs> well, there's obviously an eddy on that backside, but I think what a lot of people don't realize and something I learned a couple of years ago is that there's also an eddy on that front side where that current is hitting that hump because basically what it's doing depending on the hump here depending on you know that angle that of that front side that current could be hitting that hump so hard where it creates a bubble in the front where it gives fish a place to stack up oh, absolutely. I've seen it and i've applied it in certain scenarios when i've been graphing over a hump in current situations and i've seen them on the front side and it's basically you can see depending on the hump, depending on how that arc is of that hump and where that, that current will smack into it and then therefore push up, it'll create that bubble on bottom for fish to sit into. So I think obviously, you know, at least in my mind prior to learning that was always backside of humps, backside, backside of whatever it might be, points, whatever. Uh, where I think it is, if you look at the structure that you're fishing, it is worthwhile to look at that front side because I think on that front side too, with that current hitting them, they're going to feel that and they're going to be a little bit more aggressive than maybe the fish would be on the back side of it. Oh, absolutely. Those are the fish that have to feed because they are in the main brunt of the current most of the time. Mm -hmm. like if you catch them on the front side, there's two times I like to do that. First thing in the morning, they tend to pull up on the front side and eat really aggressively and well. And then on that stacked wind, mm -hmm. because you can slow down and fish it more efficiently. I've always found that the biggest fish live on the front, and then off the back and not on top. You so, usually have more aggressive big ones on the front and then those sluggish, lazy, big old fat meat nuggets are going to be sitting off the back. Yeah, so that's exactly <laughs> it. So you'll catch giants on the front. but So let's take a Great Lake Smalley, for example, when you get into a, a river system. You might catch a 20-inch, which is a – giant fish right a 20 inch fish on the front of a boulder but it might be four and a half pounds that's because he's a lean mean eating machine mm -hmm. and then once you slide back into this bubbly soft current that will be behind your boulder that's where you're going to catch a six pound 20 inch fish mm -hmm. because they're just back there sitting in this little bubble that they have they don't really have to work hard because all the hard currents kind of going over them and back flowing into them and they just sit there and all of a sudden, these minnows come by, all the aggressive ones up on top smash the minnows. That current sucks in these beat-up, half-dead ones, and they have an easy lunch meal, and they don't have to exert a ton of energy. Those are the harder ones to catch, but they're the most rewarding ones. So mm -hmm. like, as we're talking about current here, so we go on that visualization from Picasso to Andy on the front. I drew up like a basically like let's call it a mock of what it would look like so this is your hump here the top of your hump and then you have your little shelf off the side and that's where your little aggressive guys dudes will sit dudes and gals and then you'll get your fat sluggish lazy ones back here you like my two jig bailey i like that <laughs> so you cast up you always want to cast up to where you think it's 
the aggressive ones are going to be because obviously those are the ones that you're probably going to want to pick out first. And right. then once you start catching those aggressive ones, and that current slides you off that that hump. You can figure out a, if you can figure out in time a way to get your tube down these little topography changes and get it down here in these sluggish ones and present it properly. They will eat it because it's like, oh, I just had a free meal fall into my lap. Why wouldn't I eat it? It's just all about presentation. There's some tricks you can learn as you go. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, and I'm here's a little bit of juice for you when it comes to current fishing. And it doesn't apply everywhere. It applies very certain situations. I'll actually open my bail as I'm drifting in that current because I'm like, I feel the top of it. I feel the top. All of a sudden, I feel nothing. I will open that bail and let that bait slam into the bottom, close it, feel the bottom again. And then when I know I lost contact with the bottom, I'll open my bail and let it slam down. And that's because I'm coming off of those pumps. And I, can, I can't tell you how many times when I've closed that bell, I've had a fish. Because that bait just free lines drops right into their face. Yeah. Pound and bottom can be good. I mean, you hear about ice fishing guys do it all the time. They're like, oh, pound bottom. And it's just kind of a way to rough up, get things yep. a little bit turned on the bottom, and it gets their attention. Yep. Yeah. It's just something different those fish don't see very often. So a little juice yeah. for everyone when it comes to current. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think the last thing that we're we're kind of kind of to check off. It's kind of similar, to like a Mississippi River, uh, these small creeks and such, where really it's more of a cock accessible that we're talking about. Some of these shoal bass, those are the easiest freaking places to fish because it's so obvious where those fish are going to be. They're dumb. They're so dumb because they don't see people, and it could be some of the most fun fishing. Yeah, it's, I I might try to designate time this year to like really try to find areas like that around here. I will send uh, you. I would really love to go down to like that North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama that have those creeks and make a trip of it. Don't even touch the big lakes. Just go in those creeks. Bring like two or three rods and have a ball. Because if you guys, I mean, I, I urge you guys to go check out like uh, ND, it's ND Yak Angler, uh, like literally capital N, capital D, Yak Angler. He has some crazy creek fishing videos. And then Justin Lucas has some too, where there's, it's like you're bringing one or two rods, like a jig and a spinner bait, and that's it. And you're just crushing them because, like, they don't see baits. They don't see the pressure that the lakes do. Uh, it, if you're in current, naturally, those fish are going to be much more aggressive. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to get bites. Um, it's just really trying to understand the water and try to simplify things down to try to get maximize, obviously, your potential to get more bites and bigger bites. But yeah. I might have to send you the GPS coordinates that little creek I used to fish all the time. That would be a lot of fun. If I had a kayak, I, <laughs> I had a kayak. I think I would go there more than anywhere else because those fish do not see baits. I think I would like to get those GPS coordinates. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it, 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 it is a cool. So do you remember? I don't know if this is slightly before your time and. Any of the listeners, if you listen to this, comment on the YouTube if you know what I'm talking about. So before Yum, there was a brand. It was an FLW brand they sold at Walmart of lizards. And we would go with like a number, like a one on EWG, weightless uh, green pumpkin chartreuse tailed lizard. And it smelled like garlic and butthole. Like it was <laughs> bad. And it's all bush and tree line. And what we would do on spinning rods, and I'm telling you, I was like 14 years old, 15 years old last time I did this. And we would take these lizards and we would skip them up underneath these trees, just up current and let them float down weightless because it's only like a foot or two deep. And you would literally watch 18 inch smallmouth come up out of these trees and rocks and eat these lizards and go back down. Like we're talking 80 to 100 fish in a day. And they're oh all 15 or 20 inches. <laughs> Those GPS coordinates right now. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was telling you about it last summer. So I used to um I used so to all lay downs? What? You said it's all overhanging trees and everything? Yeah. That sounds like swim jig haven. Yeah, I've I've they don't eat big baits for whatever reason. Yeah. Like a war a war eagle 316 ounce finesse spinner bait was like the juice. Hmm. 
once I learned like about that, um, I know, like a, that chatter, willow vibe. size five. Maybe like that little willow vibe chatterbait. Yeah, probably. That'd be a lot of fun. Like it takes a little bit to figure out where they're sitting. But then the other issue you run into is there's 40 to 45 inch pike in this creek. I hate pike. And they will destroy your life. <laughs> but, um, to this day, I remember I, I, I weighed the one. I've caught two largemouth there. One was four and a half pounds and one was six and three quarters on a spinnerbait. Good God. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you holding out on me, dude? <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> I've caught two largemouth out of this creek and they were both the just beautiful and they get like you know like those mississippi bass where they're black yeah they get black that's sick yeah and they were but, probably in the calmest water what they were probably in the calmest water no they were in the current they were in a tree in the current what the heck Stupid yeah fish. <laughs> and you see your lizard or your spinnerbait just disappear and you're like oh it's another 13, 15 inch smallmouth, and you lay into them, and all of a sudden you see this big head shake, and you're like, What the <laughs> giant lark? Yeah. That's awesome. It was so cool. It sounds like it. And I remember like exactly where I caught them too. Like I drive by it sometimes when I go steelhead fishing. I'm like, I remember right there, I caught a six pound largemouth. <laughs> <laughs> <It's new. laughs> yeah, dude. That's sick. Oh my gosh. So, well, dude, for the folks, uh, is there anything else we can cover talking current fishing before we sign off for tonight? No, um, I think what we have to do is get out on the boat and kind of show some graph and what we're looking at and break it down that way here in the near future. Once yeah, it gets warm. I need to do that 1,000%. One, 1, um, I think what would be cool to do is obviously get out in the water and show these different scenarios, show how we apply them. Uh, but I think it would be cool to do – uh, cause I know we mentioned at the beginning how we don't have any experience on tidal water. Um, we have that Bassmaster open on the James river. Uh, I think it'd be really cool to, uh, sit down with Destin that I'll be traveling with after that and have him talk about like the James river and kind of how that tidal stuff affects it and how to kind of how to approach it. Uh, you know, have like Destin sit down and talk about the James or like Brian Schmidt talk about, you know, the Potomac and, uh, I think it'd be really cool to kind of talk about that. Um, it would be really cool to get Ike on here and talk okay. about Potomac. Like, for the next episode, recap of Pickwick and Current and talking tidal fisheries of the Sabine River. Yeah, it's perfect. Current. It's current week. And it, is, <laughs> it is currently. It is regular podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the Serious Tangler. The Serious Tangler is next week. So yes. I don't know if we mentioned that. Um, as well before we sign off here tonight again folks episode 200 it is not going to be something that you're going to learn a lot of fishing information from it's Maybe going to be backlash stories like the time grandma whipped you because you tried to make her pick out a backlash whatever like just <laughs> <the fire. laughs> it'll be it'll be a fun uh fun night if you guys are looking to kick back bring a drink you know whatever if you guys want to come join us talk stories uh, if you'd like to be on the broadcast, get in contact with us. Get in contact with us. We'll send you an invite. You can come join us. We're going to talk fishing stories all night. You know, embarrassing stuff, crazy stuff you see on the water. Uh, your some of your worst stories, wh whatever have you. We're it's going to be a, a night where we're going to take a couple hours and just kind of kick Here's back. Your story time. It's going to be story time, pretty much. And it's uh, we're going to have a bunch of the different guys that have been on the show on uh, to chat, uh, catch up. Um, talk about a whole bunch of different stuff. So if you guys would like to be a part of it, not only would we love to have you guys tune in, but if you want to actually be a part of the stream, get in touch with us, and uh, we would love to have you. So beyond that, dude, I think – do you have anything else for the folks? I was going to say one thing we could throw in on that Serious Tangler podcast is any of our friends that fish that know us and has fished with us, maybe it could be like a mini roast night where they come on and tell like ridiculous stories about us too. Like I don't care. Bring the fire. I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> like, <It happens. laughs> I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff, like where I've put like dents in the back of pontoon boats or something, throwing a one ounce jig. Like, I'm sure there's something ridiculous out there. Somebody will have. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. Or trying to boat flip like a six and a half pounder when I have no business doing it. I'm 
12 pound test and breaking them off like just dumb, dumb stuff <laughs> me literally ruining our potential tournament win late being lousy with this one <laughs> Okay, look, I blame Lake Erie. We'll save it for next week, but I blame Lake Erie Smallmouth the weekend prior for that being so lazy with that fish. <laughs> okay, basically the quick story for the folks. I know I don't want to make you guys wait till next Wednesday. Basically, I had the winning fish on that would have won Andy and I the tournament pretty much. And I came from the weekend just catching 100 plus you know, four or five pound smallies on Lake Erie. They you know, never whatever. come off. Like, if you don't need them, they stay on all the time. Yeah. They, they don't just fall off when you hook them in 40 foot of water. <sighs> but I catch this one on a net rig, and I'm, it comes around the boat. It fights a little bit. So I'm like playing it a little bit, being stupid. I go to bolt flip it, and the net rig comes flying out of the air. And I'm like, oh, well, that fish is gone. <laughs> yeah, because you slack line bolt flip. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. I was like, we'll catch another one. Nope, we had four fish that day. <laughs> yep, we had three fish at that point because I caught one with like 15 minutes left when they were busting on minnows. Oh, I could have sworn we had four fish. So yeah, it was even worse. Though. We waited four, but at that time you lost it, we had three. Yeah. Yeah, we'll bring it up on Wednesday. <laughs> Uh, dude, you're like, what happened? I was like, you slacklined it. You're like, no, I did it. I was like, if we're filming it, you would see exactly what I mean. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Rod tip is straight. Bates, there's no tension on the line. The fish comes up, shakes his head as he's about to boat flip him and just comes right off. Like, it's okay. I had our biggest fish in that day anyways. Yeah, you probably did. I <laughs> Either, either way but folks it's gonna be a fun night next week i hope you guys can tune in uh as always all well, friday we're looking to get the sabine river preview pickwick lake recap uh show up for you so hope you guys can join and uh we'll see you on friday